Hello, grade school. What's going on, guys? Thanks for turning up for a special Thursday early morning, at least for me, edition of grade school. I don't know who we got out there. Me and Rafa, my buddy, we're just wondering, are we going to have lots of extra grade school attendees? Are we going to have people going, no way am I turning up on grade school or at, at grade school on a Thursday at that hour? So I guess we'll find out and see. But I'm glad you're here. It looks like EC is here. Anyway, we'll see who else turns up. Um, welcome, everybody. Whether you are here live or you are watching this recording later, I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad to be doing a bit of a deeper dive on the first installment in our series on balance that we started this week. One of the biggest topics in color grading, of course, and it has sparked so much good conversation this week. So I'm excited to sort of flesh out uh, what we began the conversation with in that pre-recorded video and, uh, you know, like uh, answer any questions that uh, you guys may be bringing into the room. Um, so hello, hello. Good morning. Thanks for being here. What's going on, Rafa? Thanks for being here with me, buddy. Hello. Everything's been great this week, working in a music video for a friend of mine and dealing with YouTube, weird stuff when uploading Rec 709, then Rec 709A and testing stuff. But yeah, it's fun. Awesome, dude. You're, li you're, 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 you're living the colorist life. Yeah, basically. Why awesome. does my video not look the way it showed in the quick time? Yep. The eternal question. Yeah. All right, gang. So uh, while everyone is finding their way into our uh, virtual room here, I have a couple of things that I want to talk about initially uh, before we take any questions. So this has turned out to be an even bigger topic of topic of keener interest just in part one even than I expected. I was, of course, I always hope that uh, our subjects and stuff that we cover here on the channel is of value and interest and relevant to what you guys are working on and thinking about. Uh, this one seems to be even more so than uh, maybe I anticipated. And I wanna start by talking about a theme that I saw emerging in uh, a lot of our comments this week on this discussion on building better balance. And that's really this idea of neutralizing or getting, you know, what you might think of as like, oh, neutral shadows or neutral highlights or just the general idea of correcting our footage into a quote unquote balanced position as a discrete step of the process that is different from pushing the image in a particular direction that we might aesthetically want to see it go. Um, this came up a lot and there were even some theories thrown out there as to why, uh, it is such a common theme and why what I suggest sort of feels like such a radical departure. Uh, and there, there it's, there's some correct observations that, you know, like we're sort of saddled as colorists, certainly when we're operating in resolve, uh, we're sort of saddled with like a lot of the vestiges of color correction. I know I learned from colorists who really came from a color correction tradition and a lot of our software, a lot of our culture, I've talked about this before here on the channel plenty, a lot of our software and culture really comes from a color correction paradigm that in my opinion, in my experience as a professional colorist, has very little to do with crafting compelling images and certainly very little to do with what I'm hired for. So I'll just start by kind of emphasizing something that I mentioned in a few of the replies to uh, comments that were left on the pre-recorded video this week. While it is important that I understand how to get neutral images. You know, if I bring in an image like, you know, whatever, actually this one, shot number six is kind of a good example because it indeed does come in a little bit warm. I need to get that neutral, right? If I don't do that, my client will not be very happy. However, no one has ever paid me my rate, at least not in like five to seven years. No one's paying me my rate to correct footage. Frankly, that would not be a very good deal if that was all I was bringing to the table. So it's not so much that getting a sensibly neutral reproduction is not a worthy pursuit or not something that I'm aimed at. It's just not something I'm very focused on because it's sort of like, it's, it's sort of like saying that, um, I'm trying to think of a great analogy. Neutralization is a prerequisite. It is not the goal, right? So if we're, you know, like racing cars, making sure that there's gas in the tank is not really the job of a race car driver. 
it's important. You won't be able to dry, run the race without gas, but that's just a prerequisite. Okay. Um, so that's sort of the first idea to think about is that, uh, you know, neutralizing uh, and getting a balanced starting position for your image, while important, should really not be the focus of what I'm describing as balance. Okay. And the other thing that sort of goes along with that is that a lot of what we have traditionally thought of as neutralizing or balancing or normalizing or the diligence of a colorist coming into a new project, that should be handled in 2022. If you are dealing with reasonably well shot material and you are color managing properly, that should be handled on the whole by your color management. Yes, there will be outliers. Yes, there will be warmer or cooler or pinker or greener shots. But if you are having to sort of like bend things into a reasonably neutral reproduction, shot after shot after shot after shot, that's a problem in and of itself. That's not something you need to grade through. That's something that you need to address the underlying issue with. Because if we are shooting something reasonably well and we are color managing something properly, the whole premise there is that we are going to have a reasonably neutral reproduction at the outset. So another reason why I'm not particularly focused or fixated on that in a conversation talking about balance like we have here in uh, Resolve. Let me just flip into this for a moment. When I'm talking about this node right here, I'm not really worried about getting a neutral reproduction because I expect a neutral reproduction. Yeah, I don't always get it. Yeah, sometimes I have to do some sweetening to get it there, but I expect that neutral reproduction. That's not diligence that I expect to owe, if that makes sense. So that's a, a sort of like initial point that I want to make there. And then the last thing I want to emphasize before we can go to a couple of questions is that another theme that came up in our comments this week is that, oh, well, why is it that you're starting to already do your look in your balance note? Shouldn't that be strictly technical? We've already covered why that's not the case. But I also want to be clear that like in this shot that we worked on this week, where if I'm doing offset and saying, oh, I want to go for kind of a more like goldy reproduction like this, that is not a look. That is an adjustment that I'm making to this shot. My look is my look. I showed this to you guys in the video. My look is happening here. I've got these two LUTs from my core elements LUT pack. That's where my look is happening. Whatever I'm doing here, that's just my balance. I don't have another word to describe that. That's just my balance. And this is another theme that I really want you to think about I don't care how anyone characterizes it or thinks about it. Balance is always subjective. There's no perfect answer to the test, okay? So this whole idea that like you need to go in and correct and align and perfect every shot and you owe that diligence before you can begin to think about things on a creative wavelength, that's nonsense. There's no such thing as a purely objective balance in uh, a color grade. It's always subjective. It's always feel-based. So why would you not simply embrace that and say, in addition to getting what I would think of as a reasonably neutral reproduction, which you're going to get just because we are going to aim at things like natural, naturalistic skin tone, if you have a good eye, why would you not go ahead and aim at what do you want the image to look like? If I want the image to be warm, why would I wait to warm the image? I've never understood that argument. So just a couple of ideas and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, like concepts to flesh out some really good discussions that came up uh, in this week in the comments following that initial pre-recorded video. That's some of my philosophy that drives the way I think about this idea of balance, which again is not white balance, it's not black balance, it's not neutralizing shadows, it's not neutralizing highlights. It's taking a sensible foundation of reasonably well shot material, accurately color managed, and then beginning the uh, intentional process of moving that image into the preferred reproduction that I am uh, looking for at the end of my color grade. So just some ideas to uh, sort of open up our conversation. Uh, and I'll take a breath there and see if we've had uh, any questions pop up so far yet, Rafa? Not yet, but maybe we can talk about the plugin. I don't, don't remember the name. It's Chromatic Adaptation. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. So uh, actually, we could go over here to shot number six, and we will probably dive into this in a bit more uh, earnestness in um, subsequent installments of the series that we're in right now. But chromatic adaptation is a really good example of coming up with a sort of like neutral technical fix to uh, a, a balancing issue that we may be experiencing. So this is maybe not the perfect example, 
But if we were to look at this image and say, okay, it seems to me that the way the camera was rated and the temperature of the light source don't quite agree. Now, I don't know if that's the case here, and this is not egregious enough of a mismatch between, uh, you know, like a, a not, a, not egregious enough of a departure from neutral that I would necessarily go for chromatic adaptation, but we certainly could. Let me just show you what that looks like. So we're going to go to this chromatic adaptation plugin here. And the whole idea is that this allows us to get a more neutral, more technical, more color science sort of supported solution if we are indeed just trying to get a more neutral starting point. And in the case of a shot like this, I would set my illuminance, uh, rather than being standard illuminance, which is more of a sort of display convention, I would think in terms of color temperature. And I would ensure that I am aligning my, or that my color space and my gamma match my color management, which I've set up here in my project settings. These settings should be correct already, DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate, but I'm always gonna set them anyway. And then we could simply start to look and say, okay, I want to get to a Kelvin of say uh, 5600 here, but I have a hunch that my white point for my image, so thus far nothing's happening because I've got same source Kelvin and target Kelvin. But I have a hunch that my source illuminant may have been a little bit warmer. So the camera was probably rated for tungsten light, right? For, uh, you know, stage lighting of some sort, because we're indoors, we're on a stage, we're on a controlled lighting. But it seems that the actual temperature of the light that was lighting this scene is actually a little bit warmer, right? So we could set our Kelvin to say 4,500 and start to get perhaps a slightly more natural or neutral reproduction. And that can be great. And the other thing that I'll uh, emphasize here that uh, is I use all the time, especially and I, if I'm working with a really common scenario, especially with nonfiction, available light, fluorescent lighting camera that was probably rated for either tungsten or for, um, uh, excuse me, uh, for either tungsten or uh, uh, for daylight, like in camera, because there's not really a rating in camera for a fluorescent source. Um, oh, and by the way, before I move on from here, I'm, I'm realizing I got this slightly wrong. I'm going to get similar results here, but what I really meant to do here is my target illuminant was probably 3200, and the source was probably something more like 2500. So similar to result to what I was getting a moment ago, but I, I paused with my uh, explanation about fluorescent uh, um, balancing because I realized I made a mistake here in this chromatic adaptation. But if we just look at, you know, like how this would work if I was looking at a shot that was clearly shot available light under a fluorescent source and the camera was rated as cameras typically are for either a daylight or a tungsten source, something that I will do all the time. Let's just paste this. Uh, I will target a color temperature of say 3200 or 5600, whatever I think the camera was more likely rated for. And then under here, I'll, I will go to standard illuminant and I'll look at these F presets. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't exactly know what these uh, correspond to other than that these are standards and are probably based on like spectral profiles of various fluorescent lighting fixtures. But what you'll find is if you can tell, okay, that's clearly fluorescent lights that are illuminating the scene. And as a result, I'm getting some bizarre like combination of like, is it too pink? Is it too green? Is it cold? Is it warm? You, like a good giveaway when you're in a situation that might need this is like, I actually don't even know where it needs to go. I just know that it looks funky. Um, and you can see that there are fluorescent sources in the frame that seem to be providing illumination. These F1 or uh, excuse me, FN presets, any of these Fs, I'll often just go and flip through these and see what gets me the best results. And this is a fundamentally different thing than any of the balancing operations that we talked about uh, in this week's video, or indeed that we, we will talk about. This is a fundamentally different operation that's being performed than something that we would do down here in our primaries or even in like our HDR zones or some other fancier area of resolve. So it's a really good way of arriving at a more robust and more tailored solution for scenarios where indeed your light source is really, really not aligned with what the camera was expecting in terms of its light source. So that's a good principle to take away and a good example of 
how I would tackle and how I would respond to say a timeline of 10 images where it's like, wow, things are just not coming in in a very effortless way. I've got good color management. I'm setting things up uh, properly based on the camera source, but everything just looks off. That's a great, great example of something that I might explore to try to figure out a system solution to the problem rather than doing, again, kind of what I was taught when I began grading, which is like, you just grade through everything. You just use your color correction tools. You start with your, you know, like un, untouched, untransformed log image, and you just spin knobs and slam wheels and push things around and try to hammer it into shape. That is like the ultimate color correction mentality or paradigm. And it really is not uh, in service of the most compelling, most cinematic, most consistent grades. So that's usually what I'm gonna leave behind. And if I'm seeing a significant mismatch in my images, I'm gonna look and see uh, what could be causing that. Is it my color management? Is it a mismatch between the lighting that was used versus the lighting that the camera was rated for? Is there some sort of system solution that I can come up with, some kind of explanation that I can find that will allow me to do something smarter than grade through it? shot after shot after shot after shot so yeah i'm glad we glad uh, rafa brought up chromatic adaptation that's a great thing to uh, deploy in particular when you've got uh, instances of uh, fluorescent lights that's where I, I use it most often how are we doing out there are we still quiet no we have questions already okay let's go for this one from edl how do you think about color separation in relation to balancing the image could you show us any technique for getting more color separation when creating a washed look, like a super warm with color separation inside it? Yes, this is a, a, that's a, a great couple of questions. So how do I think about color separation when balancing? This is actually something that I really wanted to cover today that uh, I, I didn't include in uh, part one that kind of belongs in part one, I would say. And that's that you know, we talked about like, we've talked a lot already today and in comments about what I'm not aimed at, which is like, oh, make it, you know, like neutral, get the whites white, get the shadows, uh, you know, like purely desaturated or whatever. Um, but what we haven't talked about is like, what am I aimed at? I'll give you the two things that I prioritize that I anchor my balancing around always, always, always. The first one is going to be skin. Okay. Because if you can get skin feeling good, the threshold for literally any other object or surface that you might have in an image, the threshold for getting those other things correct is way lower. If skin doesn't look good, good luck getting an audience to uh, sort of buy into and be compelled by your frame. If skin does look good, you have all kinds of latitude and margin for error with the way other objects and services are rendered. So skin is always number one, optimize skin, prioritize skin, make skin look as good as you can. And the other thing that accompanies goes right along with that connects up to the question that we're going to answer right now, separation. In general, when I am balancing, you know, we looked at this example uh, already several times of like, all right, maybe I want to go for a warmer thing. But in general, when I'm balancing, what I'm aimed at is skin tone, as we said, and then separation. I'm actually trying to max out my separation just using my offset, generally speaking. I'm usually not gonna uh, drive that agenda by uh, trying to do things with my gain or my uh, other primaries, but I'm looking at maxing out my separation and really doing that by moving the entire image into a sweet spot on the vector scope so that the signal mass is sort of skipping across at least a couple of quadrants. Basically, if you think about separation, the more sort of vectors going out in all directions that you have in your scope, the more you have textbook separation because you have strong saturations pulling away from each other in different directions, right? So that's not the only thing that I will throw at the task of separation. And again, just to remind us all, in fact, I'm getting a lot of separation from my element slots, from my look that are hap that's happening over here. So that's doing a lot of my separation for me already, but absolutely at the balancing level, the two key priorities for me are skin tone and separation. So those are kind of the two main things that I will go for uh, when I'm doing that initial balance. 
And then uh, to go to the other question about like sort of maintaining or creating separation in a wash look, it's important to recognize, well, there's actually, those things are kind of at odds with each other. A separated look with high color contrast is at odds with a washy look with low color contrast. That's just sort of the nature of it. But within that, I'll give you a, a couple of principles that you can think about. The first one would be if you are doing a washy thing, I'm trying to think of a great example. I mean, this, this image is uh, maybe an interesting one. Let's just kind of play around here for a minute. So I'm going to maybe drop some exposure. I'm going to go over to my ratio and increase some contrast. And then let's say we're going to do kind of a cool washy thing using offset. One principle that you can keep in mind is to have one sort of accent color within an otherwise very washed frame and sort of hold that accent color out. And this might be a scenario where I might look at, could I get better results with that wash with one accent sort of, uh, you know, like color harmony color by using my gain? Maybe so, or maybe even I could get that in this case by using my lift and playing my gain against it. So something like this, where overall I'm getting, let me just kind of find my way to a good result here. And I've got all kinds of light playing around in here and I feel like this is going rather pinky on me. But, you know, if we look at something like that, I'm starting to get more separated and sort of veering more toward a cool look but I've got this one sort of accent where my skin is holding out. And that of course is a very common scheme. But my point is that you can get a little bit of a sense of separation within a more washy look, if that's your intent, by looking for opportunities within the frame. It could be as obvious as a face like I was just looking at, or it could be a little detail somewhere in the frame that allows you to get a single little accent that gives a little bit of color, co color contrast in the image. And oftentimes all that's going to do is actually sell the wash. It's going to make the wash feel more warm or more cool, whatever that primary wash is. If you've got a little anchor, a little counterpoint, it's just going to sell it more and make it feel a little bit better. So that's kind of how I would think about that. But I would start by accepting, hey, if I'm doing a wash, my color contrast is going to go down. There's no way around that. That is literally the definition of a more washed look. Um, so that would be kind of how I would think about that. But you know, within that, you definitely could start to play. As I said in this week's video, I don't want to like scare anybody off of moving away from offset and using other adjustments, but you only want to use those where offset doesn't work. So if offset is moving the entire image in one direction and you want to create a little more separation or a little bit more, you know, sort of accent treatment of one or more uh, regions of the frame, you absolutely could look at, you know, like playing your lift and gain against each other like I was just doing or any other combination of your primaries. I would just start with the offset and push it as far as possible. Um, so a couple of ideas on washes, creating a little color counterpoint and sort of embracing the core essence of a color wash, which is lower color contrast. Okay, a uh, question from Three Movie Production. You were talking about the importance of skin tones while balancing. How can we get um, correct slash desired skin tones in a scenes that were lit with color lighting? Oh, this is a good question. I wish I had a better example uh, of that in this case. But, you know, the, the question of like, how can we get natural to use a loaded term or desired or, or, you know, like maybe separated skin tones in uh, a scene that was shot with like colored light. So it's, it's funny that actually is a great example of, of the sort of like shaded spectrum that this whole conversation lives on. What you're actually talking about is an object which was illuminated with a source which did not agree with the light source that the camera was rated for. Right? Does that sound familiar? We were literally just talking about that in the context of a problem that we would have to fix. In this case, what you're describing is probably a creative decision. I'm thinking about like a nightclub scene, for example, where the camera might be rated for 3200, 
but there's these crazy like you know full ctb or even more hyper blue uh sources that are hitting the subject there's a mismatch there's a, a misalignment between the source that the camera is rated for and the source actually illuminating the subject right so you could think about like correcting that out if you wanted to or you could do what I would do in that situation, which is to have a conversation, have a dialogue with the filmmaker and ask them what their intent was and ask them whether that was a mistake or I should say ascertain whether that was a mistake. I, I typically wouldn't come right out and ask like, hey, did you screw this up? I'm going to ask like, hey, w l let me ask you, like, how do you feel about this? Does this represent sort of what you had in mind when you uh, originally set out to gather the images? And if so, then my answer would be, that would be a mistake to try to move skin tone into a reproduction as if it had been lit by a source that agreed with what the camera was rated for, because that's not what was done. And that's intentionally not what was done. Something different was done on purpose. So it's very context dependent and it's where collaboration comes in uh, to the conversation for sure. Um, but in general, I'm, this is another principle that uh, I, 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 think about a lot, and I've, I've talked about it here on the channel as well, I, I, in sort of legal jargon, you could call it the presumption of innocence. I'm going to assume that you knew what you were doing when you shot your images. I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to say, hey, that didn't really come out exactly how I wanted, or now that I'm seeing it, I'd like to do something different. Of course, that's my job to help you navigate and tune those things, but I'm not going to go into a color grade, generally speaking, and go, oh, the skin is completely blue. Like it was lit by this crazy source. What are we going to do to fix that? I'm going to have a conversation and ask, well, does this align with your creative intent? And if not, how do we get it there? So it becomes more of a uh, collaboration and rarely something that I will make a unilateral move on and say, oh, we got to get that skin back into where it's, you know, reflecting uh, more of the sort of like red and orange uh, light that I would expect it to under a more neutrally lit scene. I'm going to ask, where are we now and where do you want it to go? Um, so a lot of thoughts there, but in general, I would just be sensitive to context, sensitive to the direction of the creatives you're working with. And absent those things, just try to work with the image. Assume that the image is got something really special and unique about it and try to come up with the best version of that image as opposed to, I need to get my skin to where I think skin belongs. All right. Let's go to saturation for a moment. Uh, do you still put things into an HSV color model to alter saturation? Is that a standard part of your node tree? Oh, that's a good question. So do, do I use the, the HSV saturation technique that I showed you guys uh, in uh, a recent video? I'll put it to you this way. First of all, saturation and colorfulness, that is something that, again, I want to see working really well on a system level in my look. So before I even begin grading, you know, if you look at the palette side of this image here, take a look at what's happening to red. That's a perfect example of my preference being exerted on the images in the look. So no matter where red pops up, it's going to be mapped down in terms of density as well as saturation okay into more of like a filmic red so this is my sort of first line of defense in that uh, battle for preferential saturation i'm going to try to get it right in the look saturation is something that is definitely in uh, my sort of like standard node tree i'll either do it in balance or more often in uh, a custom tool that i have that plays with a similar uh, you know, like version of saturation to what I showed you guys in that cinematic saturation video. But it's something that, again, I will, rather than taking the attitude of like, as we talked about with balance, it's like, okay, we're on a new shot. What do I need to do with the balance? Instead, the question is, okay, we're on a new shot. Do I need to do anything? And if so, why? What's my aim here? Same kind of thing with saturation. Okay, new shot. It's not a question of like, where does the saturation need to go? It's a question of like, does anything whatsoever need to happen to the saturation or does it look great as is, if that makes sense. So if it doesn't, if I want to see it go up or down, 
I have a tool that's uh, based on that cinematic saturation technique that I showed you. It's not identical to it, but it's very similar. That's my go-to for saturation. But I'll say that it's something that I try to solve at the system level. And while it is there waiting for me in my template node trees in most jobs, it is not a core consideration. And in fact, it's a great thing to talk about in the context of balance, because when we think about saturation, oftentimes, you guys may have heard me talk about this before, this sounds dumb. This sounds like overly simplistic. But a lot of the time, if we perceive too little saturation, we're often just perceiving an image that's too cool. So like, if if I were to look at this image, and my, or my client were to uh, look at the image and say, oh, this is, this is like, not saturated enough, oftentimes, all that we need is some warmth. And similarly, if we're looking at an image like this one, for example, prime example, I could totally see even a, an astute client coming in and sitting with them and them going, oh, whoa, too much saturation. You got to back off that saturation. Maybe, or maybe I just need to cool it off. So oftentimes I will try to, saturation, I think of it as more of a secondary, I guess is what I'm driving at. Try to solve my problems with primaries and try to figure out if there's indeed an issue with the overall colorfulness of the image that's not being solved in my look, or if I just need to sweeten my balance to get uh, less of, or more of a sort of perceptual colorfulness in the image. Okay, super fun question here from the Hale Collective. Is there a way to balance underwater footage that it's correct or is it just completely subjective? Oh, great question. Is there a way to balance underwater footage? So this kind of goes back to something that we were exploring a few minutes ago with the chromatic adaptation uh, plugin that we were using. The way to balance underwater footage in terms of making it objectively correct no, not really, because that's a moving target, right? Like how the light is actually moving and refracting and interacting with your subjects when you're underwater, that's a tough thing to pin down. So there is not gonna be any single objective solution. However, what you're gonna find, and I unfortunately don't have any underwater footage at hand to demonstrate this on, but what you're gonna find is if, you know, like so much of color grading is like, the expectations we give ourselves and the tools that we give ourselves to satisfy those expectations. So like just to give a concrete example before we talk about underwater material, if I look at this shot, my expectation is that I want to see a more neutral, less warm reproduction of this image. And the tools that I am giving myself are my primaries, specifically my offset to do that work with, right? That right there is going to define my outcome as much as anything. Like. I could do the best offset or the worst offset adjustment in the world, but it's going to be defined at the ground level by my expectations and by the tools I equip myself with. So if we think about underwater footage, we can think about your expectation, like, oh, let's get a somewhat more neutral, less like, you know, sort of blue washed reproduction of the image. But if we think about the tools we give ourselves, you're generally gonna get much better results by equipping yourself with a different tool. In that case, the tool that I would equip myself with would be the RGB mixer, okay? The reasons for that are sort of geeky and color science-y, but I'll, I'll sort of summarize it by saying this. Like the chromatic adaptation plugin that we looked at a moment ago, that is essentially calculating a matrix that's being applied to our image. This RGB mixer is a way of creating our own matrix where we are defining how much red, green, and blue are in my final red channel, how much red, green, and blue are in my final green channel, and same thing for my blue channel. You're going to find better results in general by changing how much red, green, and blue, how much of your original signal is being fed into uh, your final output in a three by three matrix. You're gonna get better results generally than by simply using offset or gain or any combination of primaries. So no single perfect answer to the question, but I think you will see immediately better, faster results if you try to address those issues using the RGB mixer as opposed to using your normal primaries that I might encourage you to do in a normal context. Hope that's helpful. All right, another question from EDL. The opposite from the last question, when limiting the palette to avoid distracting colors, throwing out the balance, 
how would you approach that? Uh, run that for me again. When limiting the palette, just, just read it back yeah. again. When limiting the palette of a show to avoid distracting colors, like uh, I don't remember the question, like creating the washed look. Now it's the opposite. Like, how will you approach the distracting, the distracting colors? Gosh, I'm not sure I follow that one. Like, do, do, like do you... is, is, yeah, I, I think the question is like, if you want like this super wash, like super warm color, how do you like limit, like for example, the blue tonalities that might be in the shot? Ah, okay, understood. That's a really good question. So, you know, how do, how do we sort of like artfully sculpt a washed look would be a good way to look at that. The two go-tos for me, the first one we, we alluded to already would be like, you know, just limiting the overall saturation so that I can drive things aggressively in a particular direction without crashing into the wall. So if I do like a, in this case, let's go over here actually and ripple this. And I'm gonna just do this down here. I'm doing a sat versus sat. I'm basically taking out an insurance policy that says like, as I start to push against the wall, push back harder and harder, if that makes sense. So, oh, that's actually interesting. What am I seeing in the tail light there? Let's see here. Interesting, I'm getting a little artifacting there in that, that tail light. Um, but regardless, I would look at sort of limiting my overall sat so that it's not having that much effect until I start really pushing things. And then you can see if I go and turn this off, I've got a much more sort of pronounced, actually what I should do here, I'm gonna move this sort of upstream so that everything is feeding into it. And now if I turn this off and on, you can see those saturations are kind of being held in. But the other question of like, all right, how would we deal with, like this is actually a good example. I don't necessarily love, let's see if I can make this a little happier here. This like, you know, crazy washed thing that I'm doing. Maybe something like that. Maybe drive this DSAT a little bit harder now. And then uh, to go to the, the question of like, how would we deal with say the red of the car? Like maybe I don't wanna push this wash thing any further, but I wanna deal with this car that's kind of at odds with that wash look. I would handle this uh, with a hue versus sat and just say like, all right, these red saturations need to start coming down like so. So nothing else is gonna be affected by that. I'm just starting to pull in those reds. So that's kind of how I would handle that in terms of like sculpting that palette without just slamming everything into like the southeast wall of the vector scope here. I would get the overall mass or body of the image into a place where I want it to go. I would accompany that with a sort of governor that is keeping me from slamming aggressively into the wall using like a sat versus sat curve. And then you could look at other things in the frame and start to desaturate them. So in this case, I've desaturated the red of the car I could even look at like, you know, the yellow of these signs over here and do a similar sort of thing. And just say like, oh, let's also start to pull the color out of those. And just that little adjustment there is really starting to change like the character of the image and it's making it feel less separated and more washed, right? So those would be uh, some things that you could look at there is to kind of start to get your balance, once that balance is in place, start to sculpt things uh, around that overall position of your image body so that you're deprioritizing the colors that don't necessarily belong in your more kind of washed world. All right, a uh, question from Jonathan. Do we always make the white balance exposure and contrast before the log to Rec. 709 convert? there is a best order between white balance and exposure? 
Yeah, two good questions. So do we always do our balance and exposure before the conversion to Rec 7 or 9? Yes, absolutely. I will take a dramatic pause for just a moment and give everyone here in uh, the chat the opportunity to answer live. What is the, there are many reasons for this, but, but from a practical point of view for a working colorist who is mastering images uh, that are going different places into different displays, what's probably the most important reason why the answer to that is always to do it before the Rec 7 or 9 transformation? I'll give everybody a, a chance to think about that for just a second before I give you the answer. And while I give you a, a chance to think about that, I'll answer the other question as well. White balance or, or, or exposure, or, or I'm not going to say white balance, balance or exposure first. Short answer, doesn't matter at all. There's nothing that you're going to do in your exposure that's going to make it harder to balance. And there's nothing you're going to do in your balance that's going to make it harder to set exposure. It's just what you see first. It's what itches you first. In terms of order of operations, I conventionally will do exposure first in the node tree simply because exposure matters more than balance to the eye. That doesn't mean that I have to do it in the, that order. I just don't have any reason to get fancy and do it in a different order than my priority dictates. But you certainly could, even if I had exposure over here, I could still do this and then that. And it's really not going to net you a different result. I just don't see any reason to have the node tree not reflect my flow of priority because the results are going to be the same either way. All right, let's see anybody. Uh, ah, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron nailed it. Zizo nailed it. Exactly right. Uh, so that it's more compatible with different deliverables like HDR passes. Zizo, wider gamut, more space to work in. Those are all the correct idea. We want to do our balance before our transform to Rec 7 or 9 because if you come back to me tomorrow and say, hey, I need an HDR version, I want to have a color grade that happened prior to uh, a particular display being targeted. So if I did that after in the transform to Rec 7 or 9, I'm now going to have to manually match that work for that new uh, display target, as opposed to if I do it upstream, I just have to flip around my target display to whatever the new uh, display target may be. So out of order, uh, the answers to uh, your two questions. I hope that helps. All right. Talking about chromatic adaptation, what is the difference between the plugin, linear gain, and modifying the color temp and tint in the camera raw settings? Ooh, lots of good questions. So uh, the plugin is, to my knowledge, and this is a bit uh, opaque, but I'm, I, I'll say with fairly high confidence, the chromatic adaptation plugin is computing a three by three matrix. Okay, so that's a different animal than, than gain. Linear gain is linear gain. It's gain that is being applied in a linear domain, okay? And then your temperature and your tint in your camera raw controls, that is probably also going to be, depending on the SDK, depending on the developer, that's either going to be linear gain or a matrix or possibly both, depending on, uh, you know, like it may be different for temp and tint, for example. Um, those would be sort of like the geeky color science uh, delineations there. If we think about it practically, Camera Raw, unless you are grading your entire image, your entire show, and it's all coming from one camera, I don't like to use those controls because they depend on the camera and I want to be able to apply the same manipulation consistently once I'm in my working space. I also like to do all of my work in that working space as opposed to in my camera space for the same reason. So that's generally why I will avoid using temp and tint for anything other than uh, like mirroring what was done in camera, if that makes sense. So if the DP monitored 3200, if they monitored 5600, I'm going to have that same setting in my camera raw controls, generally speaking. And then for chromatic adaptation, kind of a similar thing applies. It is a good, if you have a scene shot, I just had this recently, if you have a scene shot in an environment lit by a fluorescent source and you want a system wide and consistent fix for the shots in that scene, that's where I would use the chromatic adaptation. But let's face it, it's a little bit unwieldy in terms of like using and manipulating shot after shot after shot. So in that scenario, uh, I would be more inclined to use uh, offset or my primaries like we talked about here, 
or as uh, the question teased, something else that is a more advanced technique that can net you really good results to use gain, but in a linear domain. That's gonna give you something closer to log offset than you get, uh, you, you know, linear gain is gonna be relatively close to log offset, but it's going to be consistent across multiple color spaces and it's going to have less uh, of that sort of poisoning influence on your low, lower tonal areas. So, you know, just to demo that technique, I've shown it here before on grade school. If I right click on a node and I select gamma and I go to linear, assuming my color management has all been set up properly, which in this case it has, I can now use my gain and get a behavior similar to what I was getting with offset a moment ago, but I'm going to see less poisoning in the very, very bottom of my signal. And this is going to be consistent regardless of whether I'm in DaVinci Intermediate or Arri Log C or some other uh, camera log format because I'm linearizing, I am decoding that log encoding, if that makes sense, and I'm operating in a pure linear domain. Um, so that one is, as I said, a more advanced technique, but definitely uh, another great one that I use all the time at the individual shot level, which is maybe the biggest difference between linear gain, chromatic adaptation, and the camera raw. The only one of those that I would contemplate using on a shot-by-shot -shot consistent basis would be linear gain. The other two are too cumbersome, or they are at odds with my uh, sort of workflow intentions. All right, a question from Dan Crosby. Do you feel that using gray cards slash expo disc solves the problem of white balance or do you recommend setting custom white balance? Uh, those things can be helpful. I would say like the, the idea, the ideal sort of flow for ensuring the capture and grading of a balanced image in terms of exposure and uh, color balance would be for your exposures to light by meter so that you're not just guessing you're actually lighting by meter to also have a viewing LUT that represents the type of grade that you intend to do ultimately because that's going to change your exposure decisions a higher contrast LUT is going to cause you to fill in your shadows more a lower contrast LUT is going to cause you to say shadows look good let's roll and then when you add contrast later you're going to find that your shadows are collapsing a little bit so there's those pieces in terms of your exposure. And then for color balance, you know, shooting a Macbeth color checker chart or something similar along those lines under the same lighting conditions that you are shooting with, that can be really valuable just in terms of a confidence check on is the camera that is being rated for this temperature of light source and this light source that tells me it is producing that temperature, is the net of that system indeed netting me the neutral capture that it should? A color checker chart is going to allow you to align and account for any differences there, any error in the actual output of the lighting unit that you're using and any error in the sensitivity of the sensor that you are using as well. So that would be my kind of ideal flow if we're going all the way upstream to, uh, you know, like the capture stage, light by meter, light with a LUT that represents your creative intent, and then shoot a color checker chart under the same lighting that you are shooting your scene if possible. And that's gonna allow your colorist to get you that last 10, 15% of the way there and say like, uh, okay, I know that this source and this sensor should agree, but did they? And if not, how can I better align those things? That's a good systematic solution to uh, getting a good end-to-end -end exposure and balance uh, in shooting and then all the way through post. All right, a question from Pierre Wright. He's asking, what video on YouTube can we use to learn more about linear gain? This is my first time hearing of this concept. So the question will be, what is linear gain? And yeah. why why to use it? Yeah, so let, let's uh, very briefly talk about that. And then I will, I'll, I'll dig up that link and uh, try to post it to the, uh, here on the, on the channel when I get a chance because we have talked about it before. Basically, linear gain, you know, if we think about the, the sort of image state that we are operating in, okay, really, really broad overview. The way light exists out there in the real world, that's linear light. That's why we call it linear light. That means that if I have a, uh, you know, if I double the amount of light hitting something and I had a, a device that was capturing linear light, the code value would be double 
right? So if I capture 18% gray, double the amount of light on uh, my 18% gray card, or double the amount of light that I'm capturing, I'm gonna get 8.36 instead. We don't work in linear when we're grading, we work in log, generally speaking. Da Vinci Intermediate is a log curve, it's a big rainbow, okay? We can move things back into a linear domain, meaning the original domain they were in out there in the real world, out there in the scene before the camera captured them. And when we do that, we can make manipulations that feel more organic, more lifelike. That's what I mean when I say linear gain. That's what I'm doing when I right click this balance node, go to gamma and select linear, is I'm moving from the Da Vinci intermediate log curve into a linear curve, and then I'm applying gain which when you are in a linear model behaves like offset does when you are in a log model, just a little bit better, a little bit cleaner. Uh, so I'll find that video, uh, uh, that episode of grade school and, and try to leave a link for it so you can look deeper into that. But that's in a nutshell what we're talking about when we say linear gain, more advanced technique, but uh, potentially a very useful one that can get you some cleaner results. And was there another part to that question, Rafa? No. Okay, that's great, it. great, great. A question from Uliana. Is it okay to have one channel clipped in order to neutralize shadow shift? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Th th this is another concept that uh, comes up a lot when we're talking about balance. Your scopes are not traffic cops. They're not there to pull you over and give you a speeding ticket or tell you, you can't crash through the floor, that's bad. Look at the image. That's why it's so important to have a calibrated reference display. It's only a problem if you don't like what you're seeing. If you don't like what you're seeing, then yeah, it's a problem. And that may be a good diagnostic. If you're looking at an image and you go, gosh, something doesn't feel right. And then you look down at your scopes and you say, oh, that's interesting. I'm clipping out in one of my channels. What if I didn't do that? What if I preserved uh, my tonality in that channel? Do I like the result better? And if so, then you have a good solution there. So scopes are there to help you, not to punish you. But just because like these rules that were handed down to me when I began color grading of like, you have to hit, uh, you know, 255 or 1023, or you can never hit all the way at zero or crash below zero. That stuff's nonsense. If you like the way the image looks and you have a calibrated display, that's literally your job to be an artist and to get to that result. And the scopes don't get a vote. Only you get a vote and your clients get a vote, if that makes sense. All right, a question from Easy Sonka. Do you use HDR wheels when balancing in SDR? And also, do you even use the RGB mixer for balance? Oh, good questions. Generally speaking, no. Uh, this is gonna you know, go back to the Colorist 10 Commandments that we're always looking for the broadest, simplest solution that we can find. So if I can avoid it, no. In the HDR palette, the only thing I would ever use for balance would be my global over here, these zones I would never use for balance. They might have utility as a creative tool, but again, that's something that I would expect to have handed to me by my look, not something that I would expect to have to aim at on an individual shot basis. So the global wheel is the only thing that I would consider uh, doing balance in, uh, in terms of the HDR wheel. And then in terms of the mixer, I would say sometimes, like we talked about underwater footage a little while ago, if you give me underwater footage and it needs to be balanced out, I will probably turn sooner to the RGB mixer or to a three by three matrix solution than to my primaries, simply because I know I'm gonna get better results in that case. Um, but those are exceptions and usually scenarios where I've already tried using my primaries and not gotten satisfactory results or wonder if I might get better results with another tool. But in general, I'm just going to stick with, with primaries and uh, very rarely need to move off of those. All right. A question from Andy Jean. For green screen footage, shall we do a proper technique grading, uh, a proper technical grading as in simple balancing? Or should we grade as how the intended final look should be on top of the balance? If I understand the question properly, I think it's like, should we do like the artistic after the the technical balance? Right. It's it almost sounds like if I, I'm kind of reading along uh, with Andy's question here, it almost sounds like the question is, 
do we need to, for the sake of the composite, whether we're doing that or a BFX artist is doing that, do we need to balance it for the sake of getting a better key off the image? We actually talked about this quite recently uh, and uh, a technique that's used in compositing all the time. The ideal thing to feed into a keyer or into a tracker is often different than what we visually want to see. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to change our image to give a better stimulus to our keyer. Um, that just means that if you are compositing, and again, I don't know if you're yourself compositing, Andy, or if you are handing off to a compositor, but my approach there would, from the colorist POV would be, no, I'm gonna, my, my job is to grade the shot. My job is to make the shot look like I want the shot to look. If that's not what the compositor needs as the input into their keyer, they should and will have the tools to change what's being fed into that keyer to pull a cleaner key. That shouldn't fall to the colorist to, you know, blind pilot a better keyer stimulus in order to pull a cleaner key. That really should fall on the VFX artist, and that's why the VFX artist should have the original camera negative to work with so they can say, oh, let's swing the balance way warm or crank the contrast or whatever they might want to do to the image upstream of the keyer in order to give the keyer a better shot at pulling a clean key. That's a huge part of the craft of compositing right there. So no, I would not do anything but aim at getting the image to look like I wanted it to with green screen material. Uh, question from Darius. Do we need to do weight balance perfectly like uh, perfect values or do we have some error room like 255, 255 for the white. I'll, I'll go you one better. Not only do you not have to do it perfectly, you don't have to do it at all. Like forget about white balance. There, the scope that this is another example of such a harmful thing that like, I'm not, by the way, like beating up on you guys when I give these answers to your questions, I'm responding to like my own frustration at like being taught the same things that you are, uh, talking about uh, having been told as well, they're like, oh, you must look at your scopes in order to ensure that the image that you like is okay to like. That's not true. If you like the image that you're looking at, I do not care what the numbers show on the scopes. It's like we said just a moment ago, the scopes don't get a vote. The scopes are your caddy. The scopes are there to help you. The scopes are help there to help you diagnose what's wrong when you don't like what you're looking at. But if you like what you're looking at, the scopes don't get a vote. So absolutely not. Do you need to purely hit 255, 255, 255, or even some sort of sensible range? No. Now, if you're looking at your highlights and you're going, gosh, those are not pure and I would like them to be more pure, that's my creative intent, but I'm not quite sure where they need to go, that's where your scopes can be helpful and say, oh, well, the blue channel is half the strength of the red and the green. Let me try bringing that up and see if I like the result better. But it's there to support your visual decisions, not to uh, weigh in on your visual decisions, if that makes sense. All right. Let's go for BFX for a moment. When grading BFX, what format do you usually ask the artist for, or what is preferred? EXRs, TFs, and grade by, via ACES CG? I'd say that changes a lot. More and more these days, what I'm finding is um, VFX artists who are perfectly happy to receive uh, assets in their camera negative state. So that's often like a, you know, for your average uh, independent feature film, for example, that's going to be like if it was shot on an Alexa, that's going to be ProRes that's in Airy Log C3, Airy Wide Gamut 3. And I've uh, been more, more and more, I feel like VFX artists are, are happy to just take the original camera negative and they'll do their linearizing or whatever management they need to do in order to perform their composite. And then as you guys have heard me talk about before, my only sort of stipulation that I will give with VFX artists is like, hey, you tell me what to give you if you want camera negative or ACES linear, or ACES CG, whatever, happy to give that to you, that's easy. You just give me back exactly what I gave you. Uh, and in terms of format, that depends a little bit on that color space. If it's just like Arilog C, it can be as simple as just the you know ProRes Quad 4 QuickTime. If it's like linear ACEs, then uh, yes, EXR is uh, probably most common in that scenario to ensure that you're getting the full bit depth and the full um, you know like dynamic range of that image uh, inside of that container. So those are yeah typically EXR for linear stuff, and then 
Uh, it varies in terms of color space format, but often it's just camera log or camera negative that they deal with on their side and then convert back to camera log before they return it to me. Okay, a uh, question regarding color separation again. Is there a room for hue rotations before the washed look? I've read that to achieve the color separation in Ozark, which has like a super blue tinted look, they did the hue rotations before the temp adjustment, the, te the, the temperature and temp. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a number of ways that you could lens that. It's a really good question. Um, what I would say is, if you look at a show like Ozark, that wash, that's the look, right? That's not like something that, it's not like they just happen to land on 800 shots in a row and go, wouldn't it be kind of neat if we cooled this off a little bit? They decided we want this show to have a very, very cool look and we want it to be consistent and we want it to be system wide, right? So if we just look at it in that respect, where does the look go? Look goes here, right? Look goes downstream, look goes after the grade. So just through that lens, we would say, yes, hue rotations, literally all of the other shot level grading is gonna happen beforehand. And I would say also anecdotally that, um, or, or in support of that, that sure, you know, if you're trying to get a little more separation, like in the case of Ozark, maybe it's something like the separation between foliage and water, even though those are both in that cool quadrant, they're both gonna be swept up by that cool push but maybe we can get a little bit more of a distinction between foliage and water. That probably would indeed be easier to create and to hue rotate upstream. But to me, that would really just be, you know, part of the logic that is already prevailing of uh, doing all of your grading upstream of your look, uh, which in the case of Ozark includes a very, very strong, cool wash. Um, okay, well guys, we ended up at eight o'clock already. Let's do one more. All right, let me choose another question. Okay, this one from Smoke Cordins. When when do you use color match with a color chart? In what situation do we need to do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I, I would I'll put it to you this way. If you know, we talked a minute ago about like best practices for uh, you know, like shooting in a manner that's gonna guarantee proper preserve proper exposure and color balance end to end. If you sh shoot a color chart, as I recommended when we were answering that question, I'm gonna look at it. I'm gonna run the color checker on it. Now, if the image already looks good, I may decide I don't need the results of that color checker, but usually if it's there, I'm gonna run it and just see what it does, see how far off we are from what, you know, like if you think about a, an ideal sort of perfected scenario, in a perfect scenario where you have a perfectly accurate light that's putting out the exact light that it's supposed to and you have a perfectly accurate sensor that's capturing in the exact uh, sensitivity that it ought and you have a perfect color checker that is like 100% calibrated to uh, the colors that it is supposed to reflect. In that system, if you shoot a color checker and you use the color match feature, the color chart feature here inside of Resolve, the result of running that would be nothing, right? Because it's already perfect that's never gonna happen. There's always gonna be some amount of variation, but I like to run that just to see like, okay, wow, that's indeed really, really close. So that kind of supports what I'm seeing, which is that the image already looks pretty good. Or sometimes you'll see a decent looking image, you'll run the color chart and you'll go, oh wow, that actually does some interesting sort of complex things that now that I see them do look better, do look more neutral, do look like a stronger starting point. And it's one that's supported by robust color science. So. Heck yeah, let's use it. So short answer, if you shoot a color checker, I'm going to use the color checker tool on there and evaluate whether it has something to offer to uh, the image in, uh, and in many cases it will. Um, all right, guys, that was a great conversation. That got lively. Here, me and Rafa were all worried that we were gonna be all alone this morning and uh, we got a, a pretty good group together. Lots of great questions, lots of uh, 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 passionate conversation that I see going on uh, here in the chat as we're talking. So thanks for being here. Thanks for your great questions. I'm super excited to continue talking about balance. We've even now still just like begun to scratch the surface of all the different aspects of thinking about RGB balance in our image. So excited to continue next week when we do our pre-recorded video uh, part two, and then we'll be back for another grade school and continue talking about all things balance. 
Um, thank you guys very much for being here today. Hope to see you uh, at ResolveCon uh, over the weekend where I will be with uh, my friends, Casey Ferris and Daria and uh, Darren and uh, lots of other uh, really, really smart color people. Uh, so I hope to see you guys uh, there for the live stream. And then we will uh, see you next week for pre-recorded and for grade school as well. Oh, and last thing, uh, just on your way out, we are going to be uh, opening registration very, very soon for the Colorist Career Accelerator, which is starting in just a few weeks here. That is my four-day course uh, that uh, is aimed explicitly at giving you everything that you need to go from uh, whatever you are at in your professional color grading practice get you to the next level. So maybe you've never done a single color grading job for money before. Maybe you've done lots of them, but you're not making enough money or you want to be busier. You want to book better work. You want to get more efficient in your grading. You want to become a better negotiator. You need a better framework for how to run your business in terms of estimates, invoicing templates. You need to get better at your conforms or you need to know more about deliverables, literally any of those things. That's all the stuff that we're focused on for four days. It's all about taking you wherever you're at in your career and getting you to that next level in an organized and explicit intentional way. If you're interested at all in that, check out the waitlist uh, for uh, that course that's linked here in the description for today's video. We're gonna be opening enrollment for that very soon. The last run of this that Rafa and I did together along with my buddy Gadali sold out in less than 24 hours from uh, opening registration. 91% of uh, those seats went to people who were on the wait list. So if you're even interested and you might wanna grab a seat, get on that wait list, because if you don't, you're probably not gonna be able to grab one. And of course, you're not obligated to do anything uh, other than you know by, by signing up, you're not obligating yourself to anything. So go check it out if you're interested. And other than that, you guys have a great weekend and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.